lighting with me and it's all about the subject that I've been working on with Trifor, the company I have <coughs> A subject that's become really relevant now these days for the industry database is a lot more than you used to. Uh, the subject is how to achieve consistency without using access or a two best commit the investigative database. It's the first time I'm doing this talk, so I'm a little uh, nervous as I'm going to be. So, we'll see. Please stop me if you cannot hear what I'm saying. Okay. I've been working with databases for quite a while now. And, uh, no, no SQL since 2004. Yes. Uh, I've been especially involved with this uh, project. Uh, that we do in Denmark. We have a Seattle location on record. We say that every citizen is data. And the citizens' prescriptions is based on And it, this database is updated from a variety of sources. It's updated from hospitals and GPs and from the home care. <coughs> Sometimes these updates, they cross each other, so these people are updated on the same patient at the same time. So we need to be able to handle that situation when a conflict arises. Apart from that, we also want high availability. So um, that's, that's why we, we, we chose to go with um, eventual consistency. We need to have multiple data centers. <coughs> well, I'm not working with this. I'm an architect, uh, mostly for products, mostly there, you know, like different places. The agenda for today. First, I'll, I'll try to define the setting that I'm talking in terms of. <coughs> We're using a model and then we are building a new platform. And after that, um, something about data distribution, why, why, to, why should you distribute data? We talk about types of consistency, there are a lot of misconceptions around about consistency and especially eventual consistency. How we move towards consistency in an eventual world. So, a little bit about CRDTs, that's conflict free, replicated data types. And lastly, um, I'll go through some of the NoSQL databases and, and try to point out some characteristics of them. <coughs> so this, so this, this is a model that we're working on uh, in front of the moment. It's, um, it's a very broad model to, uh, to give an, uh, a course overview of, of the database landscape. <coughs> Yeah, there's a term called polyglot persistence that's become very popular these days. Yeah. Would it was possible to speak a little bit more now? Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> um, there's a term called uh, polyglot persistence, um, made popular by Martin Fowler recently, that is in his new book, where he talks about uh, that we are entering an era where we use a lot of different databases for different uh, tasks instead of just using one. <coughs> so this, this can be quite chaotic in all these databases lying around and that's the reason for this model. In, in memory databases are used when it's possible to keep all the data in memory. Put a couple of uh, SQL databases up there. OLTP is a very broad category, online transaction processing. It's a work from the old world, from super world. Um, and it's, it's a place where it's important to be available and availability is, is critical and uh, you want to be able to, to scale and you just want to be able to, to distribute your data. ECDB, that's no SQL databases that are very easy to get started with. They might, you might want into trouble if you want to use them for a big enterprise problem, but for us, a Lewis problem, they can be very good and very easy to, uh, to build upon. Analytics, yeah, you know analytics. Offline data processing, availability is less important. <coughs> so what I'm talking about is OLTP, it's, it's that square in the model. That's that square you have a lot of data and you want high availability, so you just distribute it. <coughs> and so conflicts arise there. So why distribute data because you need redundancy and availability obviously. It's much easier to scale on a distributed database. Another reason why we, why we are trying to distribute our, our uh, real database in the, in the case of um, the shared medication record is to get closer to the user. 
we plan on building a data center in Copenhagen uh, in order for all of the East Danish users to access that because it will be uh, faster and then get better availability because it's closer to them in the network. <coughs> consistency, yeah. We have a lot of misconceptions about consistency, especially racial consistency. A lot of you guys have been working with Many of our customers misunderstand the mental consistency. They, they think it's maybe we have consistency, maybe we don't. <clears throat> but it's, that's not the way it, it should be meant. Um, I'm trying to, to track the phrase down and it goes back at least as back as far as 95 when it was used in a, in a paper describing a system. But they talked about guaranteed eventual consistency. So we have a guarantee that in time the consistency will, um, will be there. <clears throat> This is uh, the definition of consistency from, uh, from the CAP theorem. <coughs> All notes see the same data as well. And I like to think of it more as um, autonomous uh, consistency, in the way that you have a part of the system that's able to do stuff by itself. It doesn't have to wait for all the other parts. In contrast to distributed transactions, which can be seen as very bureaucratic, everybody has to agree that this is the right way to go. So if you want to enable a small part of your system to act independently, then you need eventual consistency. <coughs> yeah. Well, so traditionally we used, used to have a single consistency model for uh, almost all problems. Almost a lot of problems. That abstraction is, is not applicable to, uh, to everything, so <clears throat> the downside of SQL, I think you know this, everything has to be in sync or else the system goes down. So you have to choose between consistency and availability and persistence. That's a cap theory, but I won't pull that up, you will obviously know that. <clears throat> The essence of the cat theorem is not that you should think through and not just be is that you should broaden your mind and see what is the real business problem here and how do we solve this instead of looking at which tools do we have to solve it. So if your problem is, is very simple and you need if you need high consistency and if you don't need extreme availability and distribution of this, then by all means stick to a SQL database because it will be the best choice for you. It is difficult to make eventually consistent systems. It does take a lot of extra work to do that. So, so stay out of it unless you need it. I think it's interesting. <laughs> Conflicting updates. So, <clears throat> if you choose to, uh, to build a system on eventual consistency, you need to handle these conflicts. I made some small animations to, uh, to illustrate what can go, or how, how these conflicts can occur, and how to, uh, to deal with them. I hope it won't be too, too flashy. <coughs> so a, a conflict occurs when the two guys uh, make the same update, make an update to the same object at approximately the same time. It doesn't have to be the same nanosecond, just within the window of ASON kind replication. In, in this slide, I have uh, two values, user A and user B, writing two values, A and B, to the same object, to uh, each region of to the, um, two different replicas of the database that are synchronized. So, let's see them here. And what happens is that the, the database will replicate these objects. Now we have a conflict because which one to choose to, to save? <coughs> there are different ways to, uh, to address this. The easiest one is just to say the last write wins. Assign a timestamp to its uh, operation, or to its piece of data. <coughs> And then check which one is the news. So now, now each database can, can compare the time frames and C1 is zero and C C0, so they can keep the V axis. It's simple but it's also very fragile. It depends on the precise synchronization of the time, as you can see that. This is how Cassandra works, for instance. And you have a very important point for some use cases. You lose data here. 
the way these conflicts are, can, be, can be detected is using vector plots. So every object is designed a vector plot. <coughs> and when it's safe, you get propagated to so the other parts of the system. So now B wants to make an update to this, so we read from this database and make some alteration. Now there's a new concept in there. And then we update the vector plot, saying, I have made a change to this object. Says uh, B colon one, but he keeps the A colon one to show that he has done it after he has done this update. And because he does that, the database is able to, to see that this one right here is a newer one. It should be deleted. So he does that and replicates it back here. Same. So that's 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 great. Uh, in vector plots, you never lose data. You get you get symptoms when you uh, when you have real conflicts. I have an example of that here. So they save the same stuff at the same time. It gets replicated, and now from the vector plots, you, you can't tell which one is a descendant of the other because they are their siblings. So the data is going to keep both. And um, the way this is handled is that usually handles that the, the application deals with it. But there's another way to, to handle such a conflict. And that, that, that's the, the CIDTs. Conflict free replicated data times. <coughs> and it, it, this is a, a set of data times which are special because of their chosen design limitations. They, 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 they can never be in conflict. It's always possible to match them. And it can be done directly by the database. So the only downside to this is that you have to find that CIDC that will fit you up to the problem. I have a, an example later on. I'll dive into it a bit deeper. The web, yeah, I have some animation here. Oops. And the, the database will by itself merge this, this data. Combined. Um, well, the last way you, you can resolve conflicts is using semantic resolution. This is what we do in the CIM application breakout. <coughs> if a doctor has to make a prescription and um, maybe the hospital has, has made a similar prescription, the same drug or drugs that interact, we should be able, we should be able to know this and start a manual process to, to fix stuff. And that, that can't be done by, by the data so we need to involve the, the client application. Let me illustrate what we do. So we get two rants, different values to the same, ob same object, <coughs> which I replicated. And when the user next time reads out this, this data, uh, he has to re prepare the data. So instead of one value, you get two values, you get siblings. I, I omitted the vector clocks here, but uh, it's a mechanism for uh, it's So this, this, this is really the only solution if you have complex data, if you have complex merge procedures, and if you, or if you want to involve other processes that all the stuff when a conflict happens. Yeah, so the, the use of merge is the stuff that writes something completely. That's the problem. So some of these are, there are three main categories of how we can resolve the conflict. Last five minutes, easy to use data, which is okay with the problem. Country free, data types. It's a bit, bit, bit uh, difficult to make them. Okay, it's right here. But it, it's really smart because you never end up in conflicting stuff. And to find this semantic resolution where you leave it also in the user, the user application. So, CRDTs. It's actually a, 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 an acronym that can be understood as many different terms. Some people call it convergent, replicated data types. Others call it commutative, replicated data types. And, but it's quite similar concepts, so it has been merged into the, the name of conflict fully replicated data types. The, the, the difference is that you replicate state using convergent. 
So what sent to over the line from one replica to another? That's that state. Either that's a and B in my example. Well, computers still want to have to uh, you know, apply functions to the data and you uh, replicate the functions. It's sort of like a transaction now of the old SQL days. One, one very, very fun, funny thing about this is that they can actually emulate each other, so they have the same expressive power. To show an example of uh, a CDMT, we uh, have a, a key set here. Yeah. It's a set of data that can only grow against uh, the D, it's a grow only set. So, what happens is that we add a lot of elements and uh, the base just goes away and away. But this, this can never be in conflict, uh, at least if we assume that we have a common identifier for our data. So, we have E we twice to be able to get represented twice because it has the same idea. <coughs> To, to get rid of data, to delete data, you can't just remove it because it might be reinserted by a, a, another synchronization or another replica. So you have to mark it as delete. That's the reason for the two P set. Two P is for two faces. So there's a, a live face and there's a dead face. In this, yeah, it's in the A to the delete, add it to the removed set. Over time, these, uh, these tombstones, as it's called, it is called a tombstone, they, they can grow and they can become quite heavy, they can become a lot of tombstones if you have many updates and, uh, and deletes. So that's, uh, that's a limitation. Sometimes you have to clean up to remove all the tombstones and start fresh. <coughs> there are different ways to do that. I like that you can change, you can delete them all at, all at once, but that requires a, a transaction with all of the participating replicas, and you can delete them one by one. That's how React does. React has a timeout for two stones that the user can set. It's default few seconds. So after few seconds, they die. Okay. Yeah, there are many, many other CLTs uh, that you can look at. Charles, graphs. If you want to know about, more about these, you should check out these papers. They are quite very good. Written by some very good friends, guys. And you can also see here uh, some groups, uh, video cards, and that's good. Some groups is from Brazil. They are the people who, who pack up the official video and release it. Yeah, it's Consistent model of OLTP databases. This is <coughs> this is just to, to give an overview of um, which databases actually use these terms. Uh, as it implemented. Last five weeks is supported by Arena Comps, the Google Comps, basically Cassandra. Yeah. Use result of the conference is not so so common. It's, it's mostly used in uh, in the Dynamo family of the NoSQL databases. That's the uh, one more. Except the Cassandra doesn't do big clocks, so it doesn't try to track your subjects. Active entropy is something that has come in so far here. <coughs> what it is is that it's a process that runs through the data and checks if, um, if you have inconsistencies between your replicas and then it fixes them actively. You don't have to do a read prepare or write prepare. It's not a bad way working on it. In the hand of Slavic programs, uh, a Slavic program is um, when you say that I need I need some of these replicas, I need a number of replicas to be available, but I don't matter. It doesn't matter which one of them it is. So if one of my primary replicas are down, then the database will just take another replica, which might not have the data I'm interested in. That's why it's sloppy. <coughs> But if you give you the, the best advice availability you can get because if some replica goes down, and this is if all the replicas that you're supposed to write to go down, then you can just take another one and write to that. So that's again availability or consistency. 
depends on the problem you're talking about. Strong consistency. You can add uh, strict programs to it. You can require that some of the replicates must be available for you to compute the operation. It's all about uh, most of the things that it's actually most of them don't have the option of, of sloppiness. So they, they have a, a lower availability. Do you have any questions? Just to see that one. Oh, I'll be in touch. I'll be in touch. I'll be in touch. I'll be in touch. What is the difference uh, with like, the document model uh, in the arcane for the uh, NoSQL database? Mm. Yeah. So, so what is the difference between the, the document model of Biak and Nola and Nola's equipment in this case? Biak is both a key value store and the document store well, because it has some of the document oriented features such as automatic indexing of, uh, yeah, of texts and uh, XML, for example, uh, different uh, data types support. So that's just quite mm. enough. We need a hurry key value. Well, it is basically yeah. a key value store, yeah, with some added features on top. Mm -hmm. yes. <coughs> Do you think that you said that the uh, user-driven data resolution is not reliable on MongoDB? Right. Uh, could you give an um, example or explain what was wrong with that? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I said it. How should you? Sorry, it's how should you? Yeah, how should you? How should you? It's on the line. That's because what comes to be does when it encounters a conflict is that it saves the new data as a new one, but it also saves the old one um, as an observation to this data. But if you compact your data and comes to be, which is something you should do regularly in order to conserve risk space, you delete all the old provisions, including your siblings, so you might lose data. Thank you.